How many of you dressed intentionally for today? I did. And I know, contrary to popular opinion, it's like, what are we, got new wardrobes here in the church? What are you doing? Well, we are talking about vacation today. And some of you I see got the memo because you've got your vacation shirts on at the same time. And I need another hand for David and for the choir and for the accompanist. And yeah, that was amazing. I know a lot of people accuse me of being Baptist, but if that was Baptist, then I'll take it all day long. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I, I don't know how in the world y'all stayed so straight in your lines, but I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know? I'd be rocking out with that. I think church should be full of emotion. I, I think we should walk away every week and saying, I gave it a 10, I laughed, I cried, danced a little bit in the aisle. We got lifted up to God, and you guys do that. Whew, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> Amen? Help me out here. Okay. So today we are starting off with vacation. Uh, some of you, how many of you love vacation? How many of you are on vacation? How many of you are on permanent vacation? Yeah, God bless you for that. All right. So here's some funny sayings about vacation. Vacation is the time of year when you can't remember what day it is. How many of you, again, are on permanent vacation? It's like, what day is it? I don't know. I don't remember. And this is for the students because I felt this way every year. Uh, vacation is a time when you forget everything you learn during the year. Vacation, one, one poor soul said this about vacation. Vacation is what you take when you can't take what you've been taking anymore. <laughs> and then I love this one. This one, there's a poster and it's got the top half of this beautiful Caribbean resort and all the palm trees and the swimming pools and the ocean, and, and it's just gorgeous. And then at the top it says, my idea of vacation. And at the bottom it's got somebody's backyard with a kiddie pool and said, but this is what I can afford. <laughs> How many of you love the beach? Okay. Good number of you. All right. How many of you have ever had tried to have a beach body? <laughs> I like this poster. It said, how to have a beach body. Have a body. Take it to the beach. <laughs> there you go. One woman said this about the beach. She said, I think my birthstone is a seashell. <laughs> and how many of you struggle with high blood pressure? All right, a few of you do. And, um, and one of the things when you have high blood pressure is you're supposed to avoid salts and all that. But listen to, listen to this. It said, the beach is the only place where salt actually lowers your blood pressure. <laughs> Something about calming and very peaceful. Well, the actual, the word vacation comes from the same word that vacant comes from. And originally the intent or the meeting was to be empty. You, you vacate your life. You vacate your stress. And can I just say that God intended for church to be a vacation? You know, God's the person who invite, in, invented vacations. And he said, you should take a minute vacation every week. You should leave the stress of your everyday life one day, it's called the Sabbath, and come and worship and be refreshed. That's what we're going to be talking about today, and that's why I'm wearing this Hawaiian shirt, because some of you are going to go home and say, hey, that was pretty cool. That pastor was wearing a Hawaiian shirt today. Some of you are going to go say, I cannot believe that that pastor was wearing a Hawaiian shirt. But either way, you're going to remember that I was wearing it on purpose so that you could remember that we, the people of God, are supposed to be on vacation. And part of coming to church, we should be happy. We should be joyful. We should be rocking out. We should be celebrating. We should be lifting up holy hands. And we should be excited about coming and worshiping a holy God. Can I get an amen? amen. And do you not think that churches would be full of a lot more people if everybody wore Hawaiian shirts and the ushers served pina coladas. 
All right, ushers, come on down with the pina. No, I'm just kidding. There's no pina coladas in church. But, I, you know, sometimes I think that'd be a good idea too, where we can just feel like every day we show up for church is a day of vacation. We get to gather with most important people and with the most important God, and we get to party. We get to celebrate. We get to be on vacation from our everyday stress. We get to let it go, and we get to focus on our Heavenly Father. Can I get an Amen. Amen. So we're starting a new series today and it's entitled Refreshed. And what we're going to invite you to do is on vacation, you're supposed to get refreshed. And so you can come to church and still be on vacation and get refreshed through our Lord. And so I want you for the next few weeks to sit back, relax, but not too much. And as we refresh our identities, we're, today we're talking about the foundation. We're, we're going through a series in Ephesians. It is a letter from Paul. He was actually on vacation. Now, some people called it prison, but the, 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 the government took care of him. They fed him, gave him lots of time to think and to pray and to study and to write letters. So that's what he was doing. And so let's take a listen as he encourages us, the church, through this letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians Chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. If you guys want to be like the head of the class and you want homework and all that, we're actually going to go all the way through the book of Ephesians. So where do you think we're going to be next week? Ephesians chapter, and the week after that, and the week after that, and then week after that, and the week after that. No, we're actually going to do five twice. We're going to be, you know. So, but, but you got the idea. So if you want to read ahead, and by the end of this uh, six weeks together, we will have been all the way through the book of Ephesians, and we will have a sure foundation in Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at our, our holy word for the day, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in, one, in the one who he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, wait, you already are. Okay. All right, so... Let me see a show of hands. How many of you love to be in control? Some of you are getting nudged right now because you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's me, All right? Um, how many of you feel stressed when you are not in control? Yeah. Well, I have to be honest about myself because most people apparently are shocked by this, but I'm actually an introvert. I'm not comfortable in front of people. I, I still think this is God's little joke on me that he pulled me out of the back row and put me up here. Um, so all you people in the back row, look out. That's all I got to say. But as an introvert, people say, you're an introvert? And I say, yeah, I don't mind leading, but I don't mind being in the back either. If you all invite me to a party at your house, you'll find me in a corner with a Diet Coke somewhere. And if somebody comes to talk to me, that's great. If not, I'm just happy with my little Diet Coke, you know. That's how I party. That's how I get crazy. But as an introvert, I process things inwardly. And so when people say you're such a natural, it's like I have to work hard at being natural. I'm just saying. Because I process things inwardly. And for the longest time, I always thought of myself as one of those just kind of easygoing, laid back kind of people because I didn't feel the need to be in charge. I didn't feel the need to lead. I didn't feel like I had to be out front. But here's something I've learned about myself and that I have to be honest with, and maybe some of you in your marriages can see this very same thing. You allow him or her to be in charge, and certainly I think many of us do that as long as the person in charge is leading the way we want them to. Can I get an amen with that? 
Like, yeah, you can lead. You can, you, can, you can choose where we go to the restaurant. As long as you choose a place I want to go, then that's fine, you know? And, and so that, that tendency is still saying, I'm only comfortable not being in control when you control things the way that I want you to control them. But today we're going to be talking about something that is totally out of your control. We're out of control. And the older we get, we begin to realize I'm not even in control of myself, much less anybody else. My husband, my wife, my kids, my parents, my church, my preacher, you know, I'm not in control of anything. And for some of us, that brings anxiety. But I want to encourage you today, I want you to be relaxed and to be fresh because God's saying to your soul this morning, I got this. How many of you watched the U.S. Open last week? It's golf, in case you don't know. And all the Timber Pines people said, amen. Yeah, all the people who live out there and golf every single day of the week and all that kind of stuff. But there was a young woman, a 21, a 20-year-old uh, woman who became famous last week. Her name is Amy Bockerstedt. Amy was born with Down's syndrome, and yet she is in mainstream, she's out there in the world, and, and she actually has earned a full-ride scholarship to college by playing golf. And uh, going back into January, she had the opportunity to not only meet one of her idols, which is pro golfer Gary Woodland, but she got to play a hole with him. And it was a par three, and she got right up to the hole, and she let fly with her driver, and it went into the sand trap. And a lot of people, when they go in the sand trap, go, oh, she didn't worry about it. She walked up with a wedge in her hand, and she knocked it within about 10 feet of the pin. Now, I'm telling you, this is on nationwide television with her hero, her idol, watching her every move. And then as she was looking at the putt, he was trying to help her line it up and say, it looks to me like it's going to go a little bit left. And, all that. and she just walked without him looking at it and said, I got this. <laughs> she walked up and drained a 10-foot putt. Now, fast forward to last week, Father's Day weekend, the U.S. Open, and Gary Woodland is ahead. He's leading. And he finally won by three strokes. And they were asking him, what were you thinking about as you were coming into the last couple of holes? He said, actually, I was thinking about Amy. And I was remembering her confidence. And that kept me confident and feeling positive and feeling in control. And so I was able to complete this. Now, what I want this to help you to understand and see is the one, one thing that you can't control anything. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't control anything. Yeah, yeah. We, we can't control anything. But the thing more than anything that we should want to be able to control is our own salvation. But you're not in control. Now, if you're like me, sometimes that's good news and sometimes that's bad news. Sometimes it's, it's bad news because I want to be in control. And, and I'm famous for asking you, do you know that you know that you know? Are you truly saved? Are you really saved? And, and, and so we want you to have that confidence. We want you to have that peace. And now today I'm just telling you, you not only are you not in control, you were never in control. But you know what the big picture I want you to get out of this passage is? Is God is in control. And he's speaking into your heart, your mind, and your life to say, I got this. So for some of you, you look back in your life and you, you have some regrets in your life. You got some hurt in your life and you got some pain in your life and, and you're wondering, have I done enough? Am I good enough? Have I made the right choices? Now, in the game of golf, if Gary didn't make the right choices, he stood to lose a couple million dollars. If we don't make the right choices, we stand to lose our eternal soul. You're not feeling relaxed yet? <laughs> You're feeling stressed? You're asking yourself, asking God, am I really saved? Not feeling refreshed? Hang in there. Don't leave. 
because there's good news coming. What Paul is telling us in this passage is with quiet strength and confidence, God is speaking into our souls today and says, I got this. I got this. And, and sometimes we get confused about God. Uh, we, we, we think sometimes God's that big policeman in the sky. <laughs> How many of you love policemen? How many of you love them in your back, in your rearview mirror? Yeah, not so much. How many of you love those red light cams? <laughs> like, not at all, right? <laughs> because we don't want to have to slow down on a right-hand turn. We just want to keep going what we're doing. But those things are the eye in the sky that are always watching, waiting for you to mess up, and they go, aha, we got you. And then the government sends you a bill in the mail with your little picture on it. Wave as you go by the red light cams. But sometimes I think Satan gives us the idea that God is the big eye in the sky that's always watching, always waiting for us to mess up so he can just go, aha, I got you and here's your bill and it's unpayable and because of that, you're going to hell forever. If that's you, <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're on vacation because you need to give your bad thoughts a vacation. You need to give your stress a vacation because what Paul is saying in this passage is your salvation does not depend on you. It does not depend on how good you are. It depends on God, how good he is and the sacrifice that he predestined, he, he intended for us from the very beginning so that all those who accept him, accept the grace, it's given to us by grace. We don't earn anything. We are saved by grace when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Let me just quickly call out a couple of things from our passage. And, and these are things that I want you to hang on to and remember because number one, it says that God blesses us. He said he has blessed us with everything that we need. He has blessed us in the, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us for adoption. And I know there are people all over this room, there are people all over the world who get kind of caught up in this and I think this means this and this means that. But the way of my understanding and, and a lot of people who are like me is that, that when God predestined, it was not individuals to be predestined for heaven or hell. What he predestined was for the way of the whole world. I'm still a John 3.16 guy that says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. And so it's God who blesses us. It's God who chose us for adoption. Why do we need to be adopted? Because sin has separated us from God and we need a way back. And we cannot be good enough to get back to God. And so therefore, only thing that we can do is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So number three, it is through Jesus in whom we have our redemption. The word redemption means to be bought back. We sold ourselves into slavery when we said, no thank you to God. We don't want to live your way. We want to live our way. We want to do whatever we want to do. We want to be in control. No thanks. But then somewhere along the way, God's grace continues to rain down upon us to fill us up from the inside out and say, you know what? I the psalmist last week, we said that, that, you know, your love, O oh Lord, is better than life. I get it now. I see. It's called the Kairos moment. It's called the aha moment. It says, I don't want to live my way anymore. I believe in you. I trust you. And I want to live your way forevermore. And our, maybe some of you caught it during our prep for prayer as Ashley was playing. I have decided to follow Jesus. And I pray that that's your prayer today. It says, no, you know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No looking back. But looking to him and looking to his grace. And what has he predestined us for but is salvation. He's redeemed us. He's bought us back. And God is quietly saying to our souls this morning, I got this. 
If you're a grammar teacher, it's I have this. But I think God wants to get down on our level and say, I got this. I'm in control. I knew you before the world began. And I've made a way for you to be with me in eternity because I love you. If God's got this, what is our part? Is it automatic? He chose us and so we can't do anything about it? Are we universalists? And if you don't know what a universalist believes, they just believe everybody's going to end up. Jesus died for everybody. Everybody's going to be there. Like, well, okay, that's if you pick and choose what you read out of Scripture. But Jesus was pretty clear. There's two options. To be with God forever or to be without God forever. To be in heaven with him in a place of light and love and peace and joy and fulfillment forever and ever and ever. Or to spend your life in torment knowing You'd been given the choice, and you made a bad choice. You chose to go against God. So is it automatic? No. Heaven is real. Hell is real. But the good news is we've got one thing to do, and that is to give God a chance, to give God our choice and say, yes, I want to be with you. And so to all of those of you this morning, some of you have said yes a long time ago. And this morning you're saying, yes, again, this sounds good to me. I am grateful that my salvation does not depend upon how good I am, but it depends upon the grace and the love and the knowledge and the peace, the redemption of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made for me. To all those who say yes, who have said yes, and I pray that there's somebody here today that maybe God is speaking into your heart and maybe you thought you said yes some time ago. Maybe you thought of yourself as a believer, but have you truly given yourself fully to him, accepted his grace? Are you still trying to win his merit, win his favor by trying to be good enough? Then I need to tell you, just chill out, relax, refresh. It is only by Jesus Christ and his, by his grace by which we are saved, by putting our faith and our trust in him. And I pray this day that there's somebody here that's saying right now, yes to Jesus. I wanna invite you to let go of your stress and your worry, give it a vacation, and be refreshed in the knowledge of your own salvation. Amen? Let's pray.